Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Cost of Capital in a Year of Elections. I'm Kevin Madden and will be your host today. As a leading independent provider of risk and financial advisory solutions, Kroll leverages our unique insights, data, and technology to help clients stay ahead of complex demands. Kroll's team of more than 6,500 professionals worldwide continues the firm's nearly 100-year history of trusted expertise spanning risk, governance, transactions, and valuation. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. On your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable. Feel free to move them around to get the most of your desktop space. You can expand the slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. We encourage you to submit questions during the presentation using the Q&A widget on the left-hand side of your console. If we don't have a chance to answer all of your questions, we will respond to you directly by email. A recording of today's webinar will be posted to Kroll's website and distributed to all attendees in due course. Finally, today's webinar will include four polling questions. We will use the results to create a survey report that we'll share with the public. You will be able to compare your views on cost of capital and economic issues relative to those of other finance and valuation professionals. As a gentle reminder, this presentation is made available by Kroll for educational purposes only. And now I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers today. Carla Nunes is a managing director in the Office of Professional Practice based in our Philadelphia office. She's also the global leader of our Valuation Digital Solutions Group, which produces cost of capital thought leadership, content, and data housed in the Cost of Capital Navigator. She has over 25 years of experience. In her OPP role, she provides firm-wide technical guidance on a variety of valuation, financial reporting, and tax issues to, the, to global project teams. Our second speaker today is Jim Harrington, who is a director in our Valuation Digital Solutions Group based in Chicago. Jim provides technical support and client engagements involving cost of capital and business valuation matters and is a leading contributor to Kroll's efforts in the development of studies, surveys, online content, and tools. Jim and Carla are co-creators of the Cost of Capital Navigator. Thank you for your participation. I will now pass it over to our first speaker. Carla, take it away. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So we have a packed schedule. Uh, this is the table of contents for today. We'll start with some projected economic growth for different geographies. Uh, we'll uh, look into recent financial market performance and some cool election analysis, uh, how markets perform during like elections. Uh, we will talk about uh, how the current environment of uh, interest rates is impacting the risk-free rate how the U.S. equity risk premium is looking like in a year end of elections, uh, as well as the U.S. cost of debt uh, ramifications. And then we will end by looking at our Eurozone equity risk premium analysis and just a small, um, you know, update on country risk. So uh, before we do that, we'll have our first polling question. And this is just to understand where our audience comes from. So in which re country or region are your valuations primarily focused? And so this is um, United States, Canada, Latin America and Caribbean, EMEA, so Europe, Middle East and Africa, Asia Pacific or other not applicable. So uh, if we uh, look at, um, uh, you know, the... The makeup, we'll just give it a couple of uh, seconds to, to, to let the audience um, uh, respond. So we have a sense of uh, where we are. Uh, and I think we're at probably a good chunk of people have responded. So I'm going to go and go to the results. So it seems like the majority is in the United States. We do have some people from Canada and EMEA, um, uh, as well as other places. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so let's start with, uh, you know, projected economic growth. And I, before we get really started with the analysis, I just wanted to address a question that sometimes uh, I get, we get after these webinars or at conferences. And a lot of and, and people will say, well, why are we talking about the economy? And does that have anything to do with cost of capital? Well, the health of an economy has a direct bearing on interest rate policies by central banks, which then impacts risk free rates and the cost of debt. And likewise, economic growth has an impact on the outlook of 
corporate profits, which then influences equity risk perceptions by investors. So, of course, after COVID was declared a pandemic and followed by Russia's war on Ukraine, um, it became really apparent that it's difficult to forecast the path of economic growth. So to mitigate forecasting errors, we use several reputable sources of real GDP growth and take a median of those estimates. So let's go first to the global economy or the world economy. So um, 2024 was a year where uh, more than half of the world went through general elections or it's still expected to go to the polls like, like the U.S. So we have major economies like the U.K. and France in Europe you know, Mexico and India and emerging markets, among many other countries. What we have seen is that there has been a rise in populism, which means that policy uncertainty may be in the cards for next year. Uh, And for now, for now, a soft lending does seem plausible for the global economy. Uh, This means that the surge in inflation in late 2021 and into 2022 appears to be under control without causing a major recession. So that's sort of the definition of a soft landing. Projected growth of 2.7 for both 2024 and 2025 is not exactly stellar. Um, From 1980 to 2019, the average real GDP growth for the world economy was actually around 3.5% based on IMF data. So 2.7% is slower. Uh, We can also see that in uh, global oil prices. So uh, the price per barrel has been hovering around $70, $70, which is a sign of expected lower global demand. Uh, And this is despite the armed conflicts uh, that are going on in the Middle East, and there's a potential for further escalation. But that's not seems to be... See, you know, making itself into the oil prices um, fear, fears. So um, the global economy was actually, you know, kept in check or, or more resilient thanks in good part to the U.S. So the U.S. economy has been way more resilient than economists expecting. Many economists actually over the last two years have been saying that a recession was going to take place. And that actually hasn't happened. You know, instead, the U.S. managed to grow at 2.5% in 2023, and it's expected to match that level in 2024. Now, that's in good part thanks to the excess savings that consumers had due to the, you know, fiscal programs uh, implemented after COVID. Uh, Growth is expected to decelerate in 2025 as those excess savings are used up. Uh, and, and, And we'll talk about that later. But the base case right now is not for a recession, just for a slowdown. Now, talking about, you know, those fiscal uh, programs that I was just mentioning for the U.S., um, let's see what was enacted uh, in response to COVID. Uh, Were they a big deal? Well, we had a a similar chart last year for those of you who attended, but um, there's a big difference between last year's slide and this year. It turns out that nominal GDP for the U.S. economy, so like the size of the U.S. economy, was revised up significantly for 2020. So instead of the picture we had before where it seemed that the U.S. economy had shrunk by almost 3% due to COVID, the revisions show that the U.S. economy only declined by 0.9% uh, or about half a trillion, do- a trillion dollars. So this compares to the size of the fiscal packages that amounted to uh, around $5.7 trillion or 26% of 2019 GDP. This is the largest proportion in the entire world in terms of fiscal packages after COVID. And more than half of that spending was approved in December 2020 and in March 2021, which means it, it didn't even have anything to do with what happened during the COVID contraction. Um, so clearly, this the economy did not need necessarily the extra stimulus. But what that did, the helicopter money led to a surge in economic activity, like really stellar uh, real GDP growth, for example, but also created the perfect breeding ground for inflation uh, to rise and national debt to rise. So 
after after COVID, we've had like other programs that have been enacted. Uh, a lot of money has been spent on them. Some of them are, you know, have not. Like this is supposed to be spending over a 10 year period. Um, and uh, this is l reflects the latest revisions. Uh, but um, this industrial policy funded by debt uh, means that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of debt is coming into uh, the United States uh, in terms of proportion of GDP. Uh, if we look at this, this shows you the, um, you know, for, first of all, why does this matter? Why why do I care about this for cost of capital in particular? So, if a country level of debt rises significantly, uh, it may see sovereign credit downgrades. We saw that already. And you can see an increase in long-term interest rates over the long run. So this chart shows the nominal GDP for the U.S. in the green line, whereas the blue line uh, shows the debt issued by the U.S. government that is held by public investors. Okay. So from 2000 until the global financial crisis back in 08, the average debt to GDP was about 35%. After the global financial crisis, the ratio rose progressively. But after COVID, it's now averaging around 95%. And it's expected to continue to increase. So the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office is re uh, just released a report in June. And they say that the level of spending under existing law is unsustainable. So the country cannot continue to, um, re uh, you know, create debt uh, 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 debt fueled spending or you will risk a high or increase in interest rates and all other kinds of repercussions um, so and of course we are in a year of elections right uh, and both candidates are promising significantly more spending uh, according to every day there's a new announcement there's independent estimates out there that say you know national debt could rise somewhere between two and eleven trillion dollars depending on the candidate. I mean, the good news here is that many of the campaign promises are never executed, uh, particularly if you have a divided Congress. Uh, so many of these promises may not see the light of day, but the outcome of these elections may indeed have a material impact on the debt trajectory and have ramifications for the rest of the world. So now let's turn to the Eurozone. Uh, the Eurozone, uh, the twin impact of high energy prices after the Russia-Ukraine conflict began and the high interest rates that, you know, after the European Central Bank or ECB started raising interest rates because of inflationary pressures, the impact has been very negative for the Eurozone. So uh, Germany continues to drag the overall picture. Germany traditionally has been the engine of growth for the Eurozone. Uh, but it actually saw a, a small recession last year. And quarterly speaking, uh, growth continues to oscillate between uh, expansion and contraction. Uh, in addition, for the Eurozone, populism has been rising across countries in the area. Uh, and that can create further uncertainty. So an example is the recent elections in France, right? Uh, so the while the ECB has started cutting interest rates in June... And it's, you know, we will talk about that more, that they're expected to continue to cut rates. Um, the economy is still struggling to pick up the pace in activity. Um, as we can see from expectations that were there in the beginning um, of January 2024 versus now, so nine months later, uh, we're seeing that the economists this time for the Eurozone, they were not far off, but where they were really wrong was the expectations for the United States. And we'll talk about the, the those excess savings impact. And, and that's that's partially why. Now, the UK, uh, you know, you know, talk about, again, election uncertainty. Uh, so obviously, we just had uh, elections uh, in the UK, and there was a change from conservatives to the Labour Party. Uh, I think the consequences here is that there's still policy uh, uncertainty. Uh, the new government has indicated that there's a big fiscal hole. Uh, and so, uh, it, which is not, you know, unheard of in other countries, but the UK already had like a shallow recession in 2023 and is recovering. But 
but to the extent that there is some fiscal restraint uh, coming uh, uh, coming up in the horizon, that could have an impact on the growth trajectory. Right now, the growth is is really subpar that is expected for this year and next. Uh, now, let's turn to China, and China is the second largest economy in the world, uh, but China has been struggling. So the strength of the world economy is actually being led by the U.S. So uh, the a lot of people have heard about the Chinese struggles this year with deflationary spirals, you know, the property crisis. Yesterday, so this is like hot off the press, um, China and China's central bank unveiled a its most aggressive stimulus is the pandemic, and they're trying to pull the economy out of that because otherwise the growth target of 5% that the Chinese government has may not be achieved. Uh, the broader than expected package is, uh, you know, offering more funding, interest rate cuts. Uh, but a lot of analysts say that unless there's some fiscal uh, uh, stimulus as well, there's going to be there's going to be a hard time uh, getting out of this route. Uh, before the pandemic, growth rates were like close to 6% a, a year. Now, India is the uh, bright spot. Um, so the bright spot here is, um, you know, significant, there's significant population growth, there's skilled workforce, and it continues to attract a lot of investment in the country. Uh, this is likely to continue as more businesses are trying to find an alternative to China, so as you probably have seen all over the news, you know, the U.S., Canada, EU, they have imposed tariffs on, on China for EVs and even other products. That Those trends are probably not going to go away. In fact, they're expected to continue or even escalate. And India will actually benefit from that trend. Now we're going to go to our um, second polling question, uh, which is, do you believe that the country or region where you're located will achieve a soft landing, i.e. inflation comes down without causing a big recession and a spike in employ and employment. So option A, yes, I believe we will achieve a soft landing with no recession. B, yes, I anticipate a recession will take place in 2025, but it will be shallow and short-lived. C, no, I anticipate a hard landing i.e. the recession will take place in 2025 and unemployment will rise significantly. D, my country or region has been expanding significantly and a significant slowdown in 2025 is not expected and E, other or not applicable. So uh, I know it's a long question, but I think it will be helpful when we look at the survey results, um, you know, how much of this you can compare across regions uh, and um we have about 50% of our attendees have, um, you know, provided their answers. I'm curious to see which options people are thinking. And we have about uh, two thirds of our attendees have responded. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, show the results. Well, we, we, we seem to be almost split. I mean, it, the, a majority does say that the soft lending will be uh, achieved without a recession. Uh, but uh, still a good chunk of 40% still uh, think that there'll be a recession, but shallow and short-lived. So those are interesting results. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Jim to give walk through some financial market performance. Sure. Thanks, Carla. Um, this is the S&P 500 price index, uh, a measure of the U.S. stock market. It's up 151.1% since the COVID low on March 23rd, 2020. I don't know how many of you saw that coming, but I didn't. That translates into a 22.8% annual return. Now, there was some recent volatility in August due to some underperforming employment reports. Uh, also, August traditionally has low liquidity, and a lot of people go on vacation. Uh, so far in 2024, the U.S. stock market is up 17.8%. Now, this is sort of an important concept to understand. Just a few stocks, you've probably heard about this, just a few stocks have been driving the U.S. stock market. You've heard of the Mag7, the Magnificent 7, Apple, Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Meta, formerly Facebook. You can see that the Magnificent 7, since the end of COVID, which we... we uh, put at the end of 2020, we sort of coming out of COVID, ha is up 90%. 
the S&P 500 market weighted is up 58%. And the equal weighted where those big stocks are, where the returns aren't heavily weighted toward those big stocks is only up 147%. You can see that the uh, the Magnificent Seven sort of got cremated uh, during during the first round or the the big round of uh, rate hikes, but it's since since then has recovered nicely and like I say, it's up ninety percent compared to fifty eight percent. Um, these translate into people like to talk about annual compound returns. This translates into a 19% annual compound return for the Magnificent Seven, a 13% annual compound return for the market weighted S&P, and an 11% compound annual return for the uh, equal weighted S&P. Now here, this is the stock 600, pretty much the same pattern. Okay, something, uh, let's see, the COVID, uh, since the COVID low of March 18th in uh, Europe for this uh, index, we're up 84%. Now, that translates into a 14.5% annual compound rate. Um, so far in 2024, the stock 600 is up 7.4%. Now that compares to uh, fourteen point five percent in the U.S., so it is significantly lower growth uh, or lower uh, um, stock market increases for the stock six hundred compared to the U.S. Now let's talk about some election stuff. This is an election year. Here are here are the uh, returns, stock market returns in the U.S. under each of the. Uh, U.S. presidents since John F. Kennedy. You can see there was only two presidents that had negative returns. Everybody else had positive returns. Uh, Nixon and Bush Jr. And Nixon, Nixon was contending with what the uh, oil embargo during the 70s, the big oil crisis. And also there was some political instability. You remember he resigned, it, resulting in his resignation. Bush Jr. Uh, at negative 5.6%. He had what? He had the dot-com crash, and then he had the 2008 and 2009 global financial crisis. And you can see here, this is with uh, recessions overlaid of, of the returns for the president since Kennedy. You can see that Nixon and Bush Jr. were the only two presidents that had two recessions during their term. They're also the two presidents that had negative returns. Now, everybody's talking about inflation. And inflation basically ruins everything, doesn't it? And it, it even eats into your stock market returns. For example, if the stock market's up 10% and inflation was up 7%, you really only made about 3%. So it nibbles away at those returns. This is what the annual compound uh, return, total returns of the U.S. stock market for each president since Clinton looked like. You can see that inflation took a took a bite out of the returns under each of these presidents. But we've had a lot more inflation under Biden than the other presidents. So the bite there was much more significant. Nominal compound annual total returns have been 13.5 percent under Biden. But after inflation took its bite, after inflation's taken into account, those uh, returns in real terms uh, are only 7.8%. Now, here's something sort of fun, and it's sort of human nature. Presidents in their first term tend to have better stock market performance than their second term. Okay, it's sort of like, eh, you know, first term, everybody's optimistic and, you know, go, go, go. And the second term, significantly lower than their first term. How about election years versus non-election years? Election years, 5.9%. Non-election years, 7.7%. Now, so far in 2024, we've had 17.8% increases in the S&P 500 price index uh, so far. So it's sort of unusual for an election year, but the year's not over and who knows. Um, now, why would we have higher returns in non-election years? Probably just because of the uncertainty of the policy, uh, potential policy changes uh, leading up to an election. So people are a little bit more fearful. They pull in their claws a little bit. Now, here is 
before and after election day, one year before uh, and one year after. And you can see it's sort of intuitive. Before election day, one year before election day, it's about 7.8%. The year after, and the uncertainty is sort of taken out of the market, we do better. And here's something Carla was talking about, divided government. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see in the middle there, united government, where one party controls both the presidency, the House, and the Senate, uh, tends to be middling, sort of sort of average, sort of, you know, not not the greatest stellar returns. But when we have divided government up there at the top, when one party controls the presidency and another party controls the House or the Senate, we tend to do better. And there's an old saying somebody said some some somebody years ago said that when the when it when the government is gridlocked, it's actually good for business. This sort of sort of tells the tale that maybe there's a little truth to that. Now we're going to move on to risk free rate analysis. Here are ten year yields for the UK, United States, Canada, Germany, and Japan. Now, yields in government bonds across the world, basically, at least for the one, the country shown in this slide, rose dramatically after COVID. You can see that. But they are on their way down in recent months. They have declined for all of these countries in recent months. This image shows just how much quantitative easing, we've all heard that term, how much money was thrown into the economies during COVID. You can see that big bump over there on the right. It was just massive. The amount of money thrown into, into the economies during COVID over there on the right dwarfs what was thrown into the world economy by central banks during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. The 2008-2009 global financial crisis is over there on the left. It's that little bump, which we at the time thought was just massive. But now look at that compared to what we threw into the, threw into the economies uh, during COVID. Now, it's, you should note that those, the balance sheet, are they are coming down for the last couple years. So that is coming down. This next slide. Years, uh, I mean, more like the, the last year or so. Yeah. Like year and a half. Yeah. 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 Year and a half. Year and a half, two years. Okay. Now this slide, this slide, Carla talked about uh, savings. Okay. This ties into how much money was pumped into the economy, put in people's wallets. Uh, a lot of people, we lost 22 million jobs during COVID at, the, at its height, over 14% unemployment. And we pumped all kinds of money into people's wallets, et cetera. And they didn't spend. And then they started spending. But you can see this, this is excess savings. And the before revisions, it was expected to run out a little bit uh, earlier, but now it's, it ran out in, uh, what, March of 2024, it's gone negative. So I call this the party's over slide, okay? We wonder why the economy in the U.S. didn't go into recession with all the havoc that was caused during COVID. Well, it was because people still had a lot of money to spend. Over 70% of the economy is consumer spending. They had a lot of money in their, in their wallets. They had a lot of money. But you can see now, that as of uh, March 2024, even after revisions here, that that money sort of run out. So that that's actually a negative sign looking forward for the economy. Next up, these th this just is a slide that shows how far we've come. Worldwide, United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, Eurozone, all reached these high, high uh uh, inflation rates. The June 22 high of 9.1% for the United States up there at the top was uh, uh, inflation that we hadn't seen in over 40 years. Now that as of August 2024 has come down to 2.5% on a trailing 12 months basis. So we are making progress. We are making progress. All of these countries have a 2% goal. So everybody and a couple of them are at that goal. Now Canada and Germany are at that goal. But uh, but there are some stickiness. There is some stickiness here. And this is why probably the central banks, including our own, were a little hesitant to start lowering rates. Um, for instance, service inflation, services inflation is still pretty high or at least stickier. And this, 
This uh, also continuing that thought, inflation in the U.S. as of August 2024 was 2.5%. That came down. Now, the core inflation, that, that second bar, is t- stayed at 3.2%. That, the core inflation excludes the volatile food and energy categories, okay? But that's still sort of sticking up there. It's still, come, it's still way down from where it was. However, it hasn't come down as much as the all, in, the all items inflation. And that could explain why the Fed was so, so hesitant to start lowering rates. And here, this this is what everybody. When you go and go to the grocery store, or you go and fill up your gas tank, this is this is the slide that tells you why you sort of cringe when you pay your grocery bill or fill up your gas tank. You can see all inflation, all items over there on the left. Inflation in general for the whole basket of goods is up about twenty one percent since the end of COVID. Core inflation up about 9.19. Food is up 22%. That's the groceries. But the big one, the big one that people just really cringe at and has effects on almost everything else is energy. Energy in general is up 43%. That's why you sort of, that's why when you get that electricity bill or you fill up your gas tank or you pay your gas for cooking or heating your house, it's sort of painful. Up next We've got, this is the same balance sheet, but this one's just for the U.S. Central Bank. This is the Fed. You can see we reached a high of $9 trillion as of March 2022. That's down to 7.1%, which reflects which a 21% decrease. It is coming down, but man, was it high. Again, look at the difference between what we pumped into the economy on COVID and over there on the left, the 2008 financial crisis, which is just a little bump in comparison. Here is just a record of Fed increases, uh, the Fed federal fund target rates, increases and decreases. You can see after after the dramatic 100 basis point decrease during COVID, there's been 11 rate increases, 11 since March of 2022. Um, now, just recently, because I know you, all you're paying attention, the Fed lowered their target uh, federal funds target rate by 50 basis points just at their September meeting. And Carla now is now going to talk a little bit about uh, risk-free rate normalization. Go ahead, Carla. Um, thank you, thank you, Jim. And just a quick comment on the uh, on the 50 basis points because a lot of people got surprised by that, and uh, the the issue is whether or not that signaled. Uh, a potential recession. So here's the connection, right? And most economists are saying that now, after reading through the tea leaves of the Fed press conference and and projections, etc., they're coming to, most of them are coming to the conclusion that the U.S. is still on a path, the base case, for soft landing. And that was just a, a way of avoiding getting into a cooling job market, getting into trouble. So uh, get back to how does this impact risk-free rates, right? What is the connection? And many of you will know that uh, there were times where we were proposing using a normalized risk-free rate or what we can call like a, a, a fundamental rate if there was no interference by quantitative easing, uh, massive monetary policy interventions by central banks. And so, um, you know, there's different ways you could do this, like averaging or build up methods. We actually went back to the fundamentals, uh, back to this equation uh, that was really uh, created by uh, or put together uh, by uh, an academic in the 1930s. His name was Irving Fisher. And that's why this is called the Fisher equation. And essentially, it says like, you know, your nominal risk rate should be comprised of a a real rate estimate and an estimation for inflation. What is the expected inflation? And given that we're looking at long-term uh, risk, risk-free risk rates, right, because we're, for the most part, are valuing companies uh, as going concerns, uh, it does matter where these estimates are. And so for the real rate, believe it or not, like uh, we've been looking at this since 2015, but now it's actually made it to a lot of financial press. 
if you go to the Wall Street Journal, uh, CNBC, Financial Times, etc., a lot of them will be talking about this, what they call the neutral rate of interest or the natural rate of interest or the equilibrium rate of interest. And what is that? That is like what would be the risk-free rate over the medium to long term uh, where you have maximum employment, you have a lot like a good job market without creating price pressures without creating upward inflation. And so that rate, you know, lots of academics, we have over like maybe 50 uh, for the U.S. of academic estimates of what uh, that real rate would be, that neutral rate would be. And they were going down after the global financial crisis, but since COVID, they've, they've come up. Uh, and so they're now in a range of minus 0 0.3 to 2.6 uh, if you just start counting 2022. And some of the reasons that are given for that increase in the real rates are increases in productivity due to AI. It's an example. Or there will be large investments needed for energy transition. That could also cause a long-term real rate increase. And last but not least, if there's an expectation that uh, budget deficits and national debt will continue to increase. So those are some of the things that are like pushing up the real rate, which has an impact on the risk free rate, right? Uh, if you look at long term inflation expectations for the US, they have come down materially. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we were looking at this, it, the, the median estimate was 2.9, uh, and the median now is 2.3. So we're back more to that target level. So the Fed is indeed achieving that, that soft landing. And in, in long term inflation is anchored, meaning it's centered around that 2%. If you were to put all of that together, this would give us a concluded normalized or fundamental risk-free rate of three and a half percent for the U.S. Uh, but uh, but, you know, right now, the conditions of large, uh, you know, quantitative easing and, you know, keeping rate artificially rates down is not a um, the scenario that we're living in. So we're actually saying use the higher of the spot rate or the normalized risk for rate. Now, we have just FYI in the handouts, you, we, you will see that we have other countries in there. So we have what the normal, the fundamental rate would be for Canada and the UK and Australia. Um, so you, you feel free to go back and, and look at that. Um, but for now, this is the, the US. Now, let's take a look at Europe. In, in particular, uh, what you know, this is the equivalent chart to what uh, Jim was showing for the actions of, of the European Central Bank versus the Fed. Um, the ECB deposit rate, so one of the three policy rates, uh, this is the one. And um, it also increased, you know, the highest in the Eurozone history, the fastest pace was 450 basis points cumulative. So uh, it actually came from a negative level. It was used to be uh, a negative uh, pre-COVID um, and, and during parts of COVID. And we're finally out of the negative territory. Uh, in June, the ECB started cutting rates. So we already saw two, uh, conse uh, two consecutive uh, uh, cuts of 25 basis points. The ECB um, uh, president, Christine Lagarde, has indicated that it's unlikely that we'll see a, a, a a cut in the next month, they'll have to be looking at what Jim was saying. Be careful about how is the service inflation uh, is behaving, whether it's coming down as well, whether it's still sticky uh, before they declare victory on inflation. Uh, this is a view. This is actually, um, you know, analysis that we took out of data from Refinitiv. Um, what are the expected probability adjusted uh, future rate cuts for both the Fed and the ECB. So the Fed data is in blue and the ECB data is in green. So you can compare over until next year, September 2025, where markets were saying, uh, you know, as of last Friday. Now, be mindful that this data changes very rapidly. You know, markets aren't always right. Uh, and uh, and lately, uh, they've been changing more dramatically on a day-by-day -day basis. So this is just a view, right? Uh, but essentially what this is saying is that uh, markets are expecting that a year from now, the uh, the policy rate, the short term interest rate that the Fed uh, is targeting is around three percent. 
and the ECB will be around 2%. So if you, you know, that gives you a sense of like where if the yield curve goes into a more normal level, if there's no big recessions, that means that shorter term yields would be lower than higher term yields. So long term yields might be, uh, you know, a little bit higher than these levels. Um, now, this based on that, we're looking also at Germany uh, uh, risk-free rate and using the same methodology of looking at the real rate, uh, rate estimates, long-term inflation expectations. Uh, we're at uh, you know a conclusion of around two and a half percent, which is very close to the fifteen-year yield government bond for Germany. Uh, we're going to go now to the next polling question, and then we'll look at to equity risk premium analysis. So which methods or data sources do you use as the equity risk premium in your cost of equity estimates? Now, this is a select all that apply. So anything that applies, you select. So we're talking about, you know, long-term historical average published by Kroll, supply side uh, ERP published by Kroll. Uh, Kroll US and or Eurozone recommended ERP, Professor de Modron's implied ERP, Professor Pablo Fernandez's survey of ERPs, a different source, BVR cost of capital professional or other. So that's option G, like, you know, marketriskpremium.com, Pepperdine survey, other sources. And H is not applicable. So in this case, you would select, click on all that apply. And we're going to start, this is like just a precursor for the next section, which Jim will be talking about the U.S. equity risk premium. So we have about 60% of our audience responding. And uh, we're, uh, okay, we're about at two thirds. So we're going to push the next, uh, the results uh, to see where we, we stand. So we're at, you know, a lot of people use historical averages uh, and um, some of, some people use also the recommended ERP and Professor DeModrin. So a, 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 a range of options. So with this, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Jim to talk about the U.S. equity risk premium. Thank you, Carla. Uh, as Carla mentioned, we also publish a Kroll recommended ERP, and it's a two-step process. First, we identify the range uh, where we're pretty sure the real, the true ERP li uh, is lies, and then we say, where are we in the range? Right now, the range where we th we're pretty sure the true ERP is is somewhere between 35 and 6%. We look at all kinds of things. We do look at historical averages, uh, realized ERP. We do look at forward-looking ERPs, surveys, all kinds of stuff. Take that into account to determine where we are in the range. We also look at macroeconomic uh, um, uh, stats, which I'll discuss in just a second. Right now, we're at 5%, 5%. So we're about two-thirds up in the range. OK, we just came down from 5.5 on, I believe, June 5th, but it's 5.5% uh, currently. Here are some of the things that we look at on the macro macroeconomic uh, level to determine where we are in the range. Obviously, at the top, U.S. equity markets, it is the ERP, the equity risk premium. So the U.S. equity market uh, has a has a big a big is a big component of those calculations. Um, now, people ask us, hey, we had a lot of volatility in August. How come you guys didn't, didn't change your ERP? Why didn't you go up? It was so volatile. Well, vol is up, but it's still below its long-term average. Corporate spreads have gone down. Demoter and uh, his estimate is down. Market uncertainty is down. Markets are still up, okay? And employment is up but it's not really a, that big of a deal. So basically the vol the volatility in August really uh, you know there was there's no nothing to really support raising the ERP at this time. And then speaking of unemployment, you can see job creation is cooling down a little bit. Um, usually uh, the preliminary the, the well the expected is higher than the preliminary and then the revisions have tended to, even be 
of um, revised downward. But unemployment is still at a at a historical um, low. Okay, you can see here this is unemployment over time, and over there on the right we're at four point two percent. But look, that's that's not exactly high by historical averages. Now, this next slide is job openings versus number of unemployed. After COVID, we reached a high of two people, two, two jobs available per unemployed. Now, that's come down to 1.1 1 .1, uh, jobs per person unemployed, which indicates less inflationary pressure on wages. But still, it's higher. That 1.1 1 .1 is still a little bit higher than it typically is. So we're not out of the woods on that yet. This next slide just shows um, our reaction with our current U.S. risk-free rate and our ERP um, recommendations, the base cost of U.S. equity capital. You can see over there on the far left, we increased, we went up 100 basis points during the 2000s, 2000. And eight, 2008 2009 global financial crisis. We also were on track. We tracked in the COVID, we jumped from eight to 9%. Um, this is why we do the, our recommended ERP and our normalized rate. This, this um, if we had just used historical ERPs and spot rates, those numbers uh, during the global financial crisis and also during COVID would have actually decreased, which is counterintuitive. Next up, cost of debt. Now, S&P is predicting a default rate for high yield de debt still high, but it is stabilizing and their baseline scenario, the one in the middle there, is down a little and they expect it will come down a little bit more next year. This is the default rate. Now, it's interesting Looking at this next slide, here's today's cost of debt for investment grades. That's the green line. Is the same as it was at the peak of COVID. Okay. High yield, that's the blue line, is well below where it was at the COVID high. If you're using high yield to fund debt, they're, they're not as high. So this is not signaling a lot of default risk. But... If you're pessimistic on the economy, recent volatility sparked by weaker economic data could suggest heightened vulnerability for a rapid spread widening. In other words, that spread, which is a fear indicator, has a lot of room to run. And what do I mean by this? Below investment grade is BB and below. Okay, Speculative grade spreads, that's the orange line, are lower than 400 basis point, which is historically tight. It's tight. This means investors don't expect a lot of risk coming in. However, if we don't achieve a soft landing, things could go bad. There's a lot of room for the spreads to increase. We're already at 10% yields for the B-rated debt. That's the blue line. If things go south, the spreads will widen and there'll be more defaults. There's a lot of room for the spread to widen, in other words. And the wider the spread, the greater the fear of default. Now we're going to turn it over to Carla, who's going to talk about, oops, I'm sorry, the Eurozone Hi. equity risk premium. All right. And uh, thanks, everyone, for keeping up with us. It's a lot of material, and we we understand that we're throwing a lot at you. Like, we can always get questions. We're getting a lot of questions. We may not be able to get to them, but uh, uh, we can always uh, follow up afterwards. So, uh, let's look at the other side of the pond. Uh, our uh, approach to equity risk premium is similar to the U.S., meaning we look at implied equity risk premium models, but we also look at other economic indicators to tell us whether risk is up or down uh, relative to, um, you know, the last time we changed our recommendation. So this uh, uh, here is the table of factors we review uh, be, and this compares to the Eurozone, uh, you know, between now and what it was back in December of 2020. So in general, things are either better or the same as they were back at year end. 
uh, in terms of the factors that we look at. The only exception there is implied equity market volatility. And as we know, uh, you know, there was some volatility in August, but be mindful that Number one, there's a lot less liquidity in markets in August. So a lot of people go on vacation. And so when there's rapid moves in August, that doesn't mean they would really extend to the rest of the year. So I'm careful about that. I'm also careful uh, with the fact that relative to long-term averages, implied market volatility is still quite low. Now, we're going to focus on one thing here, which is the uh a dividend discount model implied ERP and how we go about doing it. So we look at three different models. Um, one is a default spread model, which is more looking at the spread between uh, bond yields of like riskier versus less risky. Uh, the other ones are just dividend discount models. So if you're doing valuation and you're doing income approaches, you know all about discount, uh, you know, DCF models, right? Except that here we're looking just at equity. Um, and so the bottom up is where you aggregate estimates, uh, consensus estimates for each individual company that make up an index. And the top down is, uh, you know, estimates that are consensus for the index. So in the case of Europe, we look at the stocks, Europe 600, and we actually gave give more weight to the last model on this list, the top down. And the reason is that there, uh, you know, historically speaking, there's a lot more noise, like more, uh, you know, uh, estimates that are all over the place if you look at the, at the individual bottom up estimates. So on the top down. Um, even in the top down, there are many uh, different assumptions you can make, and and a lot of them are reasonable. And so, who's to say which one is the better? In statistics, when you have a lot of modelable models that are reasonable, you don't know which one is the best. What you do is you average or take a median of those results. That's just like how to reduce. That's just plain statistical modeling. If it, that's how you reduce forecast error. So we have five different assumptions regarding what is the base for your first year of your projected earnings per share. Uh, what is the payout ratio, like how much you give out in dividends? And what is your terminal year, um, uh, you know, co comprised of? And um, in order to do that terminal year, we need a long-term growth rate. Now, remember, the index and earnings are all in nominal terms. So we need a nominal, a nominal uh, terminal year growth rate. We start by looking at the long-term real GDP growth for Germany. So Germany is our proxy for the risk-free rate in the Eurozone, not just us, you know, markets in general consider Germany to be the proxy for the risk-free rate. So the long-term real GDP growth for Germany using various sources is at around 1% right now. And inflation is around 2.1%. Now, this has come down dramatically. Like after the Ukraine, um, you know, uh, invasion and where, you know, Germany was so dependent on uh, fuel, uh, you know, uh, fuel uh, coming, electricity coming from Russia, uh, it had a material impact. And long term, you know, economists were thinking that inflation was going to be more like 3% around that. So we have come a long way and we're now at 2.5%, which means, oh, let me go back, means that your long-term for the overall economy, the long-term growth rate as of September was around 3.1% using this methodology. So you apply those methods that we talked about. Here's like the three diff five different um, specifications of the model. Here's the long-term uh, growth rate and you get this picture. This is just to illustrate that anyone can do uh, implied ERP models, but they're very noisy, meaning they can give you very, they're very sensitive to the assumptions and they can change significantly. But what this tells us though, is that generally they're moving in the same direction. So the number itself may be different, but they're moving in a different direction. So the way you mitigate this error, again, like this which model is right is we take a median. So at the end of September 2024, we were at 5.8%, uh, which is in the range of our conclusion. Now we do give um, 
you know, wait to the other models. So this is not the only model. So right now we're at the five and a half to 6% is our concluded uh, 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 recommended Eurozone equity risk premium. We actually believe we are on the low end of the range of that five and a half to six. Uh, and uh, we, we don't take a single month as the number. We look at trends over the last few, a few months uh, in order to arrive at that. Now, you see there that we're using a 2.5% uh, normalized risk rate. But if you want to use the spot, it's very easy. You can do that. Right now, there's only a, a you know 10 basis points difference uh, relative to the 15-year uh, bond yield. So you can adjust our recommendation to infer a different range for recommended equity risk premium. Now, we're going to go to our last polling question, and then we'll just have like a very like small flavor of country risk update. Now, this question is about, uh, you know, where do you expect cost of capital to be? So do you believe that the overall cost of capital will return to the low levels observed during the COVID-19 recovery period? So overall cost of capital, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, wax, right? So A, yes, as major central banks continue cutting policy interest rates, risk-free rates will decline to to the 2020-2021 levels and equity risk will stabilize. So you think that WAX will be, you know, back to that 2021 level. B, no, but I believe that risk-free rates will return to 2019 levels, so prior to the pandemic, lowering the overall cost of capital. Option C, no, I believe that while long term risk-free rates will decline, they will stay at similar levels as prior to the global financial crisis of 08 09. D, no, I believe that while long-term risk-free rates will decline, increase ge geopolitical risks will lead to an increase in equity risk premia. And E, and other options are not applicable. So uh, I'm curious to see what... Uh, the expectations here are from our audience. We have about 50% um, of respondents uh, have uh, expressed their views. I'll give it a couple more seconds to, um, to get a bit of a higher response rate. And we have about uh, two thirds of uh, attendees have cast their vote. So let's see where we think overall cost of capital, where our wax going to be. Uh, so we push that. And oh, the winner is, uh, no, the risk free rates will go back not to the 2020 and 21 levels, but to 2019. So overall, we'll, we'll see a deep increase in overall cost of capital. So that's interesting. Uh, all right. So last section, country risk, it's just a couple of minutes. Uh, this is a global heat map for country risk that we have in our website for free. Everyone can look at it and it slides over time. You can see how things have changed. Let's just focus on a couple of regions and countries. So here we have Africa. Uh, and, and the reason why we're highlighting this is that we're still in June 2024, country risk using this model, this is country yield spread model from a United States uh, perspective, a US dollar perspective, it's still much higher than it was pre-pandemic, which was 5%. This is, of course, takes into account that there are countries that are struggling with a high debt load. So that would include, you know, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Ghana, um, you know, Ethiopia, etc. So struggles are still there, uh, you know, regarding the, the, particularly with this increase in interest rates that the Fed has done that has a direct impact on sovereign uh, debt that is issued in U.S. dollars. In Latin America, things have come down from the peak. Uh, there's still a little uptick there, 3.4% relative, the median contrarious premium relative to December of 2019. Uh, but things have, you know, if even in Argentina, they have come down. It's still pretty high, but have come down from those high points. Uh, let's take a deep dive into Mexico and Brazil. These are countries where we get a lot of questions often. And we can see that uh, uh, that, bo uh, that uh, 
Brazil in the lighter blue column, their country risk has been coming down nicely and it's below December 2019. They also had elections last year. Uh, well, new president uh, came last year, but uh, but Brazil has, is dealing with a, a little spike in inflation. So the central bank actually increased interest rates when they had been like, you know, uh, cutting them because they're afraid of, of inflation could pick up. Economic activity is actually really good. And we have like a slide in the extra resources for those who deal with Brazil. It's there as your extra resources. Mexico, on the other hand, is actually higher than December 19. They just had a big election. It was like the biggest landslide that the country has ever had for a president. Uh, but there's still a lot of conflict, a lot of, uh, you know, uncertainties uh, regarding the, the the crime that exists, the, gang, uh, the, the gangs that uh, have uh, impacted society. So, so it's a question mark. And so country risk, it has stabilized, but it's still higher than pre-pandemic. This picture is Spain and Italy, and this is done relative to euros. So it does matter whether or not you have a perspective in euros versus U.S. dollars. So Italians' uh, country risk premium has been declining, and it's uh, below pandemic. That's the darker green bars. Spain um, is the lighter green, and they're actually they they've been stabilizing, but they're actually higher than pre-pandemic. So just a trend. Spain has been growing very nicely. The economy has been an exception in the Eurozone trends, but just something to take into consideration. And this sort of concludes our presentation for today. So what, what we can take away from here is that, you know, the record high inflation we saw a couple of years ago had a significant impact on discount rates, projected growth rates. Um, interest rates now of safe haven countries, they have risen levels uh, that we saw in the global financial crisis, even though they've come down a little. And they may come to, come even further depending on where uh, central banks of um, their policy rates. Uh, and then finally, just a, a note that, that we always say this, the equity risk premium and country risk premium, they are cyclical and they change with your economic conditions. So you want to be on the lookout for that because there's a lot of geopolitical geopolitical risks that are in the horizon that could change the picture that we're looking at right now. I think with that, um, I would like to thank the audience for staying with us for this. And um, I will um, give it to On24 to conclude the webinar.